Story mode. Welcome to this week's episode of Story Mode, where we talk to gaming founders and executives about the industry and their insights. I'm your host, Olya Kalujne, and today we're excited to have Mike Gallagher, founder of Untitled Ad Lab, to talk about how community can impact a game's success. Mike has worked in entertainment marketing for 15 years and has spent the last seven years in community and social media marketing for the video gaming industry. He has held roles at EA Sports, Hyper Hippo, and Hot Head Games. In 2023, Mike founded Untitled Ad Labs, an independent community and communication agency for the gaming industry. Hi, Mike. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Uh, to, to get started, can you give an overview of Untitled Ad Labs and what do you do for your clients? Yeah, so um, like you said, we're, we, we focus mainly on community and communications, helping small to mid-sized game studios. Um, but we do a little bit more than that. That's kind of just like our big, our big tent poles that we like to, uh, you know, that we, we kind of use to prop up what we're doing. Um, really what we're trying to do is build fractional teams for, for these, these studios who might not have a marketing team or might have a small marketing team. Uh, and we, we bring in a lot of experts outside of, of just community, um, including creative production, uh, motion graphics, graphic design, illustration, uh, marketing, PR, that kind of thing. Anything that you kind of need to build out that, that community and communication, you know, I guess, strength within your organization that you might not be able to afford with the, you know, being a smaller studio. Uh, and we bring that to you to help you really uh, punch above your weight class. Speaking about your past experience, and you've been working in gaming with with a major focus again on building and nurturing community. What was what has been your favorite game to work on so far, and why? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I'm going to give you two. One probably going to be EA Sports NHL. There's a bit of a reason why. One, I you know growing up in Vancouver, I've always been a Canucks fan. You know, it was the first game that I got to kind of work on within the gaming space. And it was an ex-manager of mine who called me up and, and basically said, hey, uh, I know you're looking for a new job. Do you want to come check this out? I, you know, you love hockey. You know, you grew up in Vancouver. You've got an affinity for, you know, for the sport and for the team. Why don't you come over and interview for this role? And, and uh, you know, I, I got to kind of really be immersed in the gaming industry. I kind of <laughs> relive my childhood, I guess, in a bit of a way. Uh, you know, so it was it was pretty fun that way. And I, I think the second game would have to be Adventure Capitalist, which was again the first mobile game that I got to market. That community was just so cool to get involved with, right? You know, for a little idle clicker game, uh, the community was so passionate about about something that you know. I don't know if you've played the game, but it's it's literally just like status bars updating right and and you just and it's like an idle clicker um but for some reason the community just absolutely loved it and whatever we made or or created for them they just gobbled it up and we couldn't create enough content for them to to kind of be satisfied and, and immersed in this this world that you know really wasn't there i don't know it brought it just brought some really cool uh experiences to to my my work life there are different types of games right one of a more more a deeper sports fans demographic and then you have a hype like idle game or hype, almost like in a hyper casual space yeah. yeah exactly exactly yeah very different you couldn't like you know i because i was at ea for for a while and then you know unfortunately there was some mass layoffs and i was a casualty of you know that last round of, of layoffs but landed on my feet and going from you know a sports console game to an idle clicker mobile game was such a different world but the passion behind the community was just as strong Right. And I think that really is a testament to gamers as a whole and just, you know, the importance of community, you know, for the gaming space is it doesn't really matter what your game is. If you can tap into what the community actually cares about and, and that core, I guess that core proposition statement that you're offering your community, it they're going they're going to just get involved and they're going to they're going to absolutely dive into it and buy into what you're doing so it was um you know very very different but at the same time you know there's a lot of crossover in in you know kind of what we were doing to really establish a uh, really strong community and, and just find that passion which is really really cool out of curiosity how many people worked on the community side for the nhl game versus on the community side for the adventure capitalist game <laughs> okay it's funny because 
Um, I, so I didn't just work on NHL. I worked on NHL and UFC and the teams that they had on, on that, those two games were very, 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 very small. Um, I don't know if you've been to the EA Sports Vancouver office, well, I guess it's just EA office in Vancouver, but it's a massive complex. Um, you know, I, I think it's five or six floors. There's, there's three buildings, something like that. I, I don't remember. It's been a few years since I've been in. And we are this tiny little corner up on the third floor, you know, and it's just kind of like the forgotten corner, right? Um, so for community side, it was just myself on both those games running the day-to-day. -day, I Obviously, I had a manager who, who worked on FIFA and, and worked on the football Madden as well, too, and, and maybe NBA and kind of managed that portfolio. But for NHL and for UFC, it was just me. I had a graphic designer, and then I had to find time within the, the uh, uh, our, our videographer's calendars to uh, build us any sort of like video assets that we might need. So it was very, very small. And then compared to venture capitalist and, and that team, you know, as when I started, it was the same thing. It was, it was almost the exact same team size. I think, you know, there was six of us, including the customer support reps. As we grew the portfolio at, at Hyper Hippo and as we grew, you know, the competencies of the team, we ended up building like an internal ad agency uh, with, with creative um, for, for marketing and for UA. So video stills, graphic design, ASO assets, all, you know, all the pieces and components that team, I think by the time I left was, I want to say like 18, 18 people. So, you know, but we had, by that time we had five games, right? So it was, it grew quite a bit, you know, it was through COVID. So everything was, you know, in a very, the games industry was in a very different place than it is now. So we had the ability to, to do that, but we were, you know, we were doing animated shorts. We were doing docu-series. We were doing live action every month. Like we were, we were doing a lot of stuff uh, and, you know, the, the cool thing was at the time we were able to almost eliminate our remarketing budget um, for the games just because the community was so strong. We were able to start eliminating those those UA budgets quite a bit and we were able to like maintain, if not grow kind of revenue levels. So it was it was a pretty powerful tool for us during that time. Interesting. So uh, let's talk about the benefits of, of fostering community. You, you spoke about that one of the benefits of this like at Hyper Hippo effectively it replaced need to do a UA, more traditional UA. Uh, what do you see as other primary benefits around building and nurturing community around a game? Yeah, I mean, I think at a very, very high level, it's continuous engagement, right? Um, the way that I kind of look at it is you as a studio have the ability to engage your audience with your brand outside of your product, right? Um, you're, you're staying top of mind, you're growing the IP, you know, and, and, you know, that's all kind of obvious brand awareness type pieces, but once you kind of get into it, you're able to really build one-to-one -one relationships with your, with your player base. Um, you can gather feedback, which you can use then as like product updates, uh, you know, and, and you can funnel that back. Um, one of the things that I loved about working on Hyper Hippo, you know, just in comparison to let's say working on like an EA product was we had the ability to directly talk to the devs, right? So as a community team, we could say, okay, we, we've, we're hearing these breaks, we're hearing this feedback from the community, you know, um, let's get that in front of the developers right away so we can try to hopefully make some impactful updates to the game and do it in a timely manner, right? You know, at EA, obviously it's a big Fortune 500 company. It takes a long time to try to get these things up. Usually production timelines are set, you know, years in advance and they have their feature sets that they're trying to hit and then they, they ship and they move on. Uh, you know, with a live service game, that's not necessarily the case, right? So, you know, you could gather this feedback, you could funnel it back up, you can make meaningful impact to the game, but you could funnel that communication back down to the players so they're aware that you're actually doing this and taking, you know, their feedback and advice into account. And they start to become more loyal, right? You build a loyal fan base that supports the long-term sustainability, uh, you know, of a game. It allows these little mobile games to live on. Adventure Capitalist is a, you know, a little idle clicker that's now, I think, on year eight of being profitable, you know, and, and for a mobile game, I mean, sure, there's a handful of, of examples that that's, um, that happens with, but it's, it's not heard of very often, you know, the, that, that model is usually, Let's build our, you know, let's, we want to market the game for, let's say a million dollars. We know based on our ROAS curves and our LTVs, we're going to make three million, three million out of it. And then we're going to shut, shut off, you know, the, the marketing and, and we're just going to take our profit and build the next game. If you build a healthy community, you can keep that stream going, right? 
it can become a very, very powerful, powerful tool. So, um, I mean, obviously I'm, I, I'm building my business around this. So I'm, I'm obviously an advocate for, for building communities early and, and building them often and, and building them with, you know, a strength in mind. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I really do think that it's a very, very powerful part of the marketing stack for any sort of game studio, no matter where you are or what game you're making. So it sounds like community can, can make or break the success of a game, but I'm curious to hear from you also considering that you have worked on different genres and you worked on different platforms, does the effectiveness and the impact of community matter or matter different to a different extent? depending on the genre and or platform. So I think traditional wisdom is, you know, the more, the more like mid core and hardcore games, that's where you tend to have a, a very strong, loyal uh, player base. Whereas in a, like say casual mobile space, it's less so. Yeah. I, I think, you know, obviously different genres are going to have different needs from their community right but there's still there's still something to be had there and i think it's really comes down to understanding what your audience wants and what they care about you know if you're if you're going to go in and, and market I'll, I'll use nhl for example again uh, you know and compare it to something like call of duty for nhl you're simulating a sport you're simulating the real life events that are kind of going on as players in the real world get better or have really good seasons, they're updating stats within the game. As, as players get injured, you know, that is reflected within the game and so on and so on, right? As a team does better, you know, their rankings go up, so on and so on. The community knows that, right? They know that that's what we're doing and they want to see real-time results and they want to see real-time updates to the game based on what's going on in the real world, right? And so part of your communication strategy, because it moves straight, it goes straight into like your product pillars, is to be able to do that quickly, effectively, communicate that to the audience, and then make it fun, make it engaging, right? Bring, give people a reason to come back to your community and, and get engaged and see what's going on. And then, you know, build that, you know, you are, you are that kind of like that rallying cry between the real world and the game, right? This is where people come to find out what's going on and to kind of bridge that gap. Um, so like, it's a very, very different need than say something like a Fortnite, uh, or sorry of call of duty or something like that, where you're, you're looking at seasons, you're looking at skins, you're looking at, you know, power upgrades, you know, obviously I'm not, a, I'm not a shooter. So I'm probably anyone who's listening to this, who's a shooter fan is going to know. I don't really know what I'm talking about with the genre, but, um, you know, you're coming to that sort of community for a very, very different reason. And then, you know, if you're looking at something like, you know, any sort of mobile game, uh, you know, look at Travel Town, for example. Uh, it's a it's a merge game. Their community is being served entirely by rewarded deep links. You go to you go to their their Facebook page, and every other day they're like, "Hey, here's your daily rewards. Here's our daily contest. Here's this. Here's that. Here's that." And it's you know there might not be a story or something to tell on your you know to your community from the content that you're getting from that because the game doesn't really lean into that it doesn't have that as its core pillar but there is this ability to serve meaningful content to that audience and if you look at their audience like it's it's really big you know it's hundreds of thousands of people and their comments are getting or their their posts are getting thousands and thousands of engagements because they're giving them something meaningful and they're tapping into something that's actually like a core pillar of what the audience cares about you know for that community for the game so yes you know to long answer or you know long story short yes there is room for community in any sort of genre you just need to kind of tap in and figure out what it is that the audience actually cares about what are good tools to build and nurture the community for, for casual games, and how how would how would you evaluate what's the right tool for your game? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple, right? Again, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. You know, I, I know you asked me this question in uh, in our prep, and and I, I had to put some you know some real thought into this because I think a lot of the tools that you need to use are time and intuition you know, and, and just spending time within the community and, and understanding and making educated guesses as to what they care about, right? But if we're actually talking about like a real tool stack and, and you know, tools that you can use to really help you kind of take that to the next level, 
Um, there's a couple that I really like. Obviously, HelpShift is is massive if you're looking at customer support in within your community stack. You know, that's not really a social media tool, but that is, you know, a part of community because customer support is so, so important, right? Uh, if you're able to, you know, make your game's rating go up a couple points, you know, and, and let's say you're at 3.9 because you launched with some issues and you're able to raise it up just through CS to a 4.2, all of a sudden, you know, you're much more favored within, you know, the app store, uh, you know, both to the audience and, and to your reps as well, too. So, you know, there, there is an inherent value in, in using and making sure that that support and, and having all those communication points touched on, you know, but then another tool I really like is it's called Dynamo. It allows you to create similar communication bots that you would in HelpShift. Uh, but for Facebook and Instagram specifically, right? And so I'll give you an example. Let's say you do uh, a this or that post, right? Uh, you know, what is the correct answer? Is it is it A or is it B? Is it this or that? And you can pre-program this bot to respond to any variant of answer that you can think of that might possibly come in for that type of post. Anybody who answers correctly will get this message. Anyone who answers incorrectly gets this message, right? So if you're running a contest or, you know, going back to travel town, like I was saying before, um, and if you're getting thousands and thousands of messages or comments on these contests, it's almost impossible for someone to go in and answer everybody and, and, and say like, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. But Dynamo allows you to kind of take that, you know, and, and automate it. And because they integrate into the, uh, you know, into the API uh, with Facebook and, and Instagram, it allows you to automatically send them like a deep link. Right. So if you have if you have like a deep link that that automatically gives somebody gems for their correct answer, it'll serve that to them directly. And, and you know, so it's a really powerful tool. Obviously, it has its it has its place in what you're doing. But if used correctly, like we've seen some really, really interesting results from using tools like this. That's super interesting. I haven't heard about this. We're going to check it out as well. That's yeah, that's very interesting. It makes your live ops even richer. Exactly, exactly. And and they're they're a newer tool. They're um I, I can't remember the the co-founder's name. We had a conversation about a month ago. Um I'm really bad with names, sorry. <laughs> and uh uh they're they're based out of Israel, so you know they're they're a part of that kind of booming tech scene that's going on there. So um but but very, very cool, very cool product and I, I definitely recommend that people check it out. What about channels? Like how would you decide what kind of channel is right for your game? And by channel, I mean Discord versus Facebook versus TikTok versus email versus whatever else might be there in the mix. This is the million dollar question I always get asked. <laughs> what is the channel mix and how do we decide who's your audience? Who do you want to reach? You know, and, and you know, beyond that, I'll simplify it even more because sometimes, you know, doing what we've done, you know, it makes sense to be on a lot of channels. What is your capacity to create content? Do you have a video team that can produce TikTok videos, multiples every week, uh, you know, or do you just have a graphic designer and all you can do is, is create graphics, right? Know your powers and know, you know, know your team and what you actually can, can do and, and what you can create and then work within that, you know, framework as, as the, as the start, right? Because there's nothing worse than trying to get into a channel and doing it, you know, half-assed and, it, uh, you know, it, it just not being authentic because you're trying to do something that you don't have the ability to do, right? That's my first caveat. Uh, second one, you know, know your audience, like you're not going to make something for Gen Z and think that you're going to get success by creating a community on Facebook. It's not, that's not where they are. You know, you can look at the demographic trends of, of any of these social channels and, and realize that, uh, you know, it's an aging demographic. There's a lot more young people leaving those channels and they're going elsewhere. Obviously, TikTok is a big one. Uh, YouTube is having a big resurgence. Um, you know, if you're going after millennials, Instagram is always, is always a good one, but then also, you know, beyond kind of picking your channels, it's, it's understanding where you want social media to kind of be within your, you know, that pipeline, right? Uh, if you think about your traditional sales pipeline of, you know, you've got awareness and you want to go to a conversion point, right? It, where does each channel fit within that cycle? If you want to amplify, you know, a marketing beat, you know, you can place it everywhere. It doesn't mean it's going to be found, right? But, you know, using things like, like using channels like Reddit, uh, you know, to kind of be the front door of the internet and getting those, getting those pieces out, uh, you know, very, very early on for discoverability uh, or using, you know, 
Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it now, you know, for discoverability. Um, and then using things like, like Instagram and Facebook, maybe for a little bit farther down funnel and using, you know, YouTube is kind of um, like a search platform. So it really, it really just depends as to what you can do, who your audience is and where you want social to kind of fit within, within the stack. But then, you know, that, that next layer that kind of goes, you know, beyond that is a lot of times people are like, well, we've made the content. Let's just put it on all the channels I and mean, you can do that, but then you're going beyond your marketing strategy and, and kind of what you've pre-decided in the strategic phase, right? It doesn't always make sense. You know, are you going to put everything that you've got on Reddit just because it's a discoverability platform? Uh, does everything need to go on to Instagram? You know, like an, an, an example I'll give you is like, Instagram is a very evergreen channel. If you if you're running a time based contest or something like that, does it make sense to have it on a channel where where the content is always going to be front and center every time you look at it? Uh, you know, if if half your content is this is only good from this day to this day, why why put it there? You know, <laughs> like why put it there? You you can, but it just it doesn't really make it doesn't really make sense. So I think you just have to take all these things into consideration when you're building your mix and and really understand the power of the platform the power of your team and what your strategy is to, to really define who, what, where, when, and why. I wanted to ask you about Discord specifically. How, how do you see Discord as a channel in this ecosystem of channels that are available to developers to use for community? I think Discord is, it's very, very interesting. I think it's one of those ones that you can get away with using very, very early, as long as you have something to talk about. If you're going to start a Discord server, you need people who are going to be in there chatting with people and getting the conversation going, especially in the early days. If you only have a couple hundred people, let's say on your Discord, and your product is either very, very early on, or you know your your updates are once a month. You're not going to be able to rely on that community to sustain itself, and it's just going to become a dead community. And there's nothing worse than going into a Discord channel, and one person is post posted a week ago, and you try to get it going, and nobody responds for another week. It 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 just doesn't work. It falls flat, right? And then you've wasted you've wasted this you know all these people who have come on into your server really early. Uh, and you know, want to get involved and can't, but if you can, if you can make discord server, no matter how small or how big it is work in your favor, it is very, very powerful, right? Especially like if you think early on before you even launch your marketing beats, let's say you, you put out one post on Reddit, you're like, Hey, we're building this new game. We want people to come over to our discord server and, and check it out. And they do, uh, and you're able to, you know, sustain that conversation with them at a cadence that they want to engage with, all of a sudden you've built like a very, very powerful network of advocates that want to not just be a part of your game. Cause you know, at the end of the day, a couple hundred players for a game is, is not going to make or break the game. But if a couple hundred players are going to share your marketing trailer at launch, that could make or break your marketing launch and your, and your go to market strategy. Right? So it's, it's understanding, you know, the investment in keeping them engaged and keeping them, you know, wanting to be there pays off with these other things, right? You're not, it's not going to pay off by making your game, you know, the most engaged place in the world, a couple hundred players, like I said, it's not going to make or break it, but share, you know, 200 shares on your marketing trailer, all of a sudden the K factor of that is, is could be exponential, right? So uh, I really like discord. Um, I personally am not a discord expert. Uh, I've got some people on my team who, who are, and uh, it's, but it's it's very very valuable and it's definitely a tool that uh, that should be a part of your arsenal. Again, I think you have to have a communications plan and strategy in place though to make sure that if the community is not self regulating or self communicating, something is going on that you're keeping the conversation going and keeping it alive. You touched on metrics a little bit here and there. In what ways do you measure the success of community engagement efforts? Yeah, so there's there's a few ways, right? I mean, I, I don't necessarily like looking at likes, comments, and shares and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they, they look nice. Those are the kind of metrics that um, a lot of potential community members will look at as a KPI. You know, uh, if you're going to go follow a page, you want to see that other people are there and other people actually are liking the comment and, and are involved in the community. So I, I find that those are more... KPIs for the audience, as opposed to what really matters to a game or a studio. You know, when, when we look at measuring it, you know, audience growth is always nice to see, depending on kind of where your, 
where your games or where your social communities fit within that that cycle like we talked about earlier um but the big ones i think are brand awareness and k factor right as kind of like the big what can we pull from social kpis uh brand awareness is is massive obviously because it is an extension of your brand we want to make sure people are caring about it and at the end of the day you want to make sure that you're finding new people and new people are becoming aware of your of your brand and then k factor is like obviously the shareability right this one person who follows us or this one person who plays our game brings in x number of players uh you know into into the game right so um how many how many people are they inviting in or sharing or tagging within your comments to help you bring brand awareness without having to you know pay to go find other users on top of that you know qualitative feedback to understand player experience is really 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 important um finding you know finding a way to make sure you're utilizing that and and gathering that feedback and funneling it back up to the developers uh you know from that you can look at you know review score shifts stuff like that which is going to make your game appear better in you know something like Metacritic or within the app stores, that kind of thing. Um, and then depending on how your game is hooked up uh, with analytics platforms, measuring uplift in DAU, MAU, and sessions is something that you can do. Uh, however, you really need a large audience to see any sort of relevance, right? Like, cause you can go into like an apps flyer or something like that, and you can see how, how many clicks and sessions you're getting from say Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or whatever. Um, but you, you really need your audience to be super, super engaged for that to really see any sort of relevance, uh, you know, or, or uplift. Um, I would love to see, like, I know I brought up travel town a couple times now. I'd love to see what their backend looks like on this dashboard, because the amount of clicks they must be getting just based on the engagement that you see, I would assume is pretty high. Uh, and I'd love to see kind of how much organic traffic they're getting just from their Facebook page alone, sending people back into their game on a daily basis. I'm curious in terms of key factors specifically, what you described, you how many new players community member brings into a game? Tactically, however, how do you keep track of that data? <laughs> it's uh, that's super hard to answer. <laughs> Is it literally a, a person who goes through like in your example, like it's you know, there's something posted, players respond to the post and then they tag their friends. Is it somebody that manually from a game team goes to those comments and looks at how many people get tagged by a player? How, how do you execute on collecting this data? Yeah, you, you, again, it kind of has to do with what your analytics stack on the back end looks like and, and kind of understanding um, like, re like, referral, like referral data. It, yeah, you wouldn't be able to do it that way. Like it, the amount of time and, and effort, you know, you'd have to do to, to go in and, uh, and manage tags and, you know, looking at your, your IDs and stuff like that. Like it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be worth it. Right. It's more, you know, at the end of the day, it's more like you're looking at, you know, I guess an, like an uplift in engagement that you would see within your community and an uplift in organic downloads for, for first time players. Right. There, there is a bit of a putting this line over top of this line if you don't have a robust analytics stack. And, and so this is, you know, and this is always going to be a problem with community management and, and showing value within community is you're always kind of playing in the gray and having to justify your existence um, because there, there isn't really a great analytics solution for a lot of these problems with community. And, you know, going back to the tools question that you asked me earlier, it's one of the reasons I really like Dynamo is because you can, you can say, we drove exactly this many things, you know, um, but, but there isn't really a lot of analytical tools that say, you know, this is, this is the thing, unless you're in like a very robust organization, you know, but then if you're looking, you know, ha having come from EA uh, and, you know, those, those bigger studios and, and having some bigger studios on, you know, on my client roster, a lot of times all they care about is just seeing the audience growth go up. That's the metric they care about, right? They just want to see that we are building an audience. Um, so, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's tough. But then for these smaller studios, it's, it's a really big deal to bring on people uh, to kind of manage these, um, you know, th this kind of like, uh, I, I guess, work. So you do need to justify your existence, but it is, it is tough. It's tough, you know, because you can't always quantify the analytics unless you're overlaying graphs on top of each other to show correlations.
So when I was a PM on Sims, Sims Social, uh, we had a community manager and it was like a few years ago. And I remember from her that that was part of the problem. Like it's so hard to quantify. And part of the caveat there is that you may have a large community, but it is still a relatively small portion of the community that's vocal. So it's very, uh, on the qu quantitative side, it's important that you listen, but you always have to use your judgment of how far you're going in your listening and acting on the feedback, because the most vocal audience may not be representative of the majority. So it's always like a fine balance there. And then uh, we always try to figure out exactly that, like how, what's the virality of community? And Facebook days, it was easier, right? In the spammy days where you share your gifts, you, and then it's like, and then of course that got shut down. But ever since then, I personally haven't seen a, a solution that allows you to really measure virality truly, uh, or at least like more accurately. So that's why, that's where the question is coming from. I've been screaming for this one, you know, my whole career as well too, because I've just been like, there needs to be something better. There needs to be something that we can use to to track and to measure, you know, without spending hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on a tech solution that, you know, like Meltwater or something like that, right? Or some of these other these other big high end tools. There's got to be something. I mean, there's a lot of smart people out there, but for some reason, this isn't the problem that people are trying to solve. You know, but it's like, you know, and, and it is literally the second, your second biggest audience to a game is on your social channels. We don't measure it. I, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. That's... <laughs> no, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, what are, what are some of the most common mistakes that you've seen uh, game teams make when, in the community space? Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good question. Um, I think under over promising and under delivering on on updates um is a big one you know I, I think uh a lot of times there's good intentions to put out good games and good marketing um and you hope that the product is going to live up to it but but it doesn't uh you know i know that's kind of passing on the problem to the the games team but uh but it's but it's a big deal right because we you know we as marketers and, and community managers we we live and breathe by what the game team delivers us to promote um, I think, I think a second, you know, a second one would be underestimating the time it takes to actually build a community from scratch. Um, you, you know, underestimating the importance of like a well-planned launch, uh, you know, and, and those, I guess those two kind of go hand in hand, right? Like underestimating the time it takes to build a community. It's not going to happen overnight, right? You need to invest in the time in figuring out your channels, figuring out your strategy, figuring out what works, what doesn't work, you know, and You'll, you'll get a small community, right? And then you launch and you're gonna get a massive boost and everyone thinks, hey, this boost is great. This is gonna continue forever. And then it flatlines again. Um, I mean, but it, it's, it's your product, right? Your product launched, you have a big splashy thing to talk about, but now you're going back to that organic trickle and that organic uplift. So, you know, there's, there's always been, like I've just uncovered, or I've come across this so many times, just this underestimation of, of how long it will take. And then, you know, the importance of a well-planned launch, what are the beats? What are the things you want to talk about so that you're not going flatline straight up at launch and then flatline, but how do you, how do you bridge it? How do you, how does the graph go from bottom left to top right continuously? And it's, it's well-planned launch, right? It's a well-planned campaign. It's, it's, it's having beats that go on. And a lot of people, they don't think about the long term. They think, I've got three months, we're gonna launch. What are we doing? Let's blow all our budget. Let's do all the creative now. The other one that I always find with community managers and, and social media managers that, that is kind of a, a pretty big mistake is they get too attached to their calendar, right? Uh, too attached to the content ideas that they've already come up with and, and developed and thought through because, you know, creative ideas are, you know, they're at the end of the day, they're a dime a dozen, but they're your baby when you've come up with them, right? Um, and at the early stages, you really need to find what works and what's not and not force content buckets onto your audience because you think they're what's important. They're going to let you know pretty quick if this style of content is something they care about or they don't care about, right? Uh, and, and they're just, they're, you know, they're going to vote with their likes, their vote with their comments and their shares, right? If they don't like it uh, and if it's not resonating, it's getting, it's getting cut. But, you know, I think, I think if you can, if you can be, and this is a, this is a term that I've, I've always kind of used throughout my career is being proactively reactive. 
You know, you, you've always got a plan. You know where you need to get to. You know what you're trying to do. You know what your key messages are, but you react to the trends you're seeing within your community and you find ways to bridge, you know, what's going on, what people care about and what's going on within, you know, trends on the channels that you're on, uh, trends of the new game, how the game's adapting, and then you can react, you know, and, and build content that kind of still hits the mark for what you need to do for your long-term goals and plans, but is based around what's happening now. We've found a lot more success with a strategy like that. So, um, you know, again, it goes back to what we were saying earlier was you need to make sure that you have the infrastructure set up, you know, within your team though, to be able to actually execute against a plan like that. Otherwise you'll fall flat on your face. More tactically, what, what guidance would you give to a game team that's looking to build community literally from zero to one, right? So it sounds like they need to start building community before the game is even launched. So what, what do you do? You have a game in development, it's sky's the limit, zero members in the community. What do you do? Start with a clear understanding of your audience. I, I can't stress that enough. Where are they? Uh, who are they? What do they care about? What do you think they care about? I mean, it's the same exercise you'd go through for marketing a game, right? Or building a game. Um, and understand, you know, how your product will work with your community. Have that conversation with your developers. Is there going to be social integrations? Is there going to be shareability within the game? What are the triggers within the game, the product that are going to allow you to grow community? And not just that, but like vice versa. Are you going to build us deep links so that we can, or deep link capabilities so that we can send people back into the game at certain instances so that you can actually build this, you know, the circular economy of, of players coming in and out of your community and your, and your game and build, uh, you know, an experience out of the brand as opposed to here's a product and here's a social channel. They speak together, not, right? Um, have a long-term goal with short-term strategy, you know, uh, think about the year, but you know, at the end of the day, the algorithms on any sort of community channel or social channel will change so quickly and you don't really ever get the heads up, you know, from Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever that, you know, long, long form video is out, short form is in. Oh, just kidding. Short form video is out. Now it's all about pictures with music on it, right? Which is the new trend on TikTok. Um, and, but like, you don't really get the heads up and then all of a sudden it's happened and you're like, well, I've got, you know, three months worth of content already built in this other style, I guess this is junk now, right? So have that long-term goal, but your short-term strategy work kind of within these buckets and these chunks and don't be afraid to, to pivot. Um, understanding the nuances of the channels that you're creating for, right? Uh, you know, and I'll give you an example actually of, of what I mean by integration too within, within a game and, and how you can find success from that. So we were working on Adventure Communist and which is a game, it was like this, the spin-off game of Adventure Capitalist. Um, the game was established, but it was, you know, it was still kind of in its infancy. It just had kind of global launched. Uh, we had no social channels and, and the, I think we had a Facebook page or something like that. And it, you know, had small, small, small audience. But we're like, well, we're seeing all the success over here in Adventure Capitalist. How can we duplicate this on Adventure Communist? And so talking to the games team, we said like, let's at, at a bare minimum, let's integrate our channels and you get like five gems to like a page on, or like our Instagram page or whatever, uh, through, you know, through the Fatui in, you know, in the product. So you get them early on, there's value and instantly you, you can drive them back to your marketing channel. So you can continue that, that cycle. Right. Um, you know, back in 2000, I guess, 2020 or 2019, when that happened, that was still kind of like a, a, a new tactic to do. <laughs> so, I mean, now it's like the bare minimum that you should be doing with a mobile game. Uh, but back then, you know, that was kind of like the, you know, it was still kind of newish to do. We saw our Instagram page within the first month grow from zero to like 65,000 followers or something like that. And so because of that, we knew exactly who our audience was and where they came from and where they were in the cycle. So we could set that long-term strategy, knowing that we are talking to people who are already converted, right? So we could set long-term strategy knowing this, but we could, sh we could set short-term, you know, strategy around here's how we're going to talk to them based on what cycle we're in with live ops, what live events we've got going on, um, when, when we've got updates going on, what do they care about? And we can build content based on those two things in mind, right? Um, another, you know, if, Going off of mobile, for example, uh, to, to PC, we were working on a, a PC game um, earlier this year, a survival crafting game. 
Uh, they didn't want to announce the product. You know, they, people knew that they were building this survival crafting game. They didn't want to announce the product though. We didn't have anything to talk about, but we wanted to find survival crafting audience. How do we do that? Well, we know we've got about three months to try to build a, a pre-audience before we even like put anything out there about the game. So let's, let's explore, let's investigate, let's try some things, right? Again, our long-term goal was we want to get to this audience size of, um, I mean, it, it was, the number was a bit ridiculous, but you know, we, we did what we could, uh, in three months, we got 10,000 people following us, uh, you know, across our channels, 4,000 on discord, 3000 Facebook, and then the other three were kind of spread out across some other channels. Um, but we tapped into, you know, the, the culture of, of the, uh, of the genre, right. We were doing a lot of, um, quick memes, trying to just gather people who are interested in the humor of the game. We tried that. It worked for a bit and then it didn't. Um, so we adapted. We tried to do more um, like like video stuff, uh, fake influencer type things, right? So we did some, we did some, um, here's the top 13 games within the genre coming out. Here's tips and tricks for like Lego Fortnite and built out like these YouTube videos. Uh, they started to do a lot better. So we're like, all right, now we're starting to figure out what people care about. And we were able to build on that um, you know, in, until, until, uh, I guess January or so when, um, we ended up reaching, yeah, like I said, around 10,000 people, but, but it, it was starting from, from nothing, having a clear long-term goal. Here's where we want to get to. Here's the small things we want to try to do along the way. Uh, and, and trying to start early, uh, you know, and, and, and starting earlier than you think you need to can be very, very powerful if it's going to be a big part of your, your stack going forward. What trends are you tracking in the community space for, for gaming? I know you have a very interesting perspective on generation differences. So we'd love to get your perspective on that. Sure. Uh, yeah, trends that I'm tracking high level. I, I think looking at the way, you know, Gen Alpha coming up is going to be, you know, exploring and, and kind of differentiating themselves from Gen Z who, you know, and Gen Z, as we all know, is the complete opposite of millennials. Um, you know, looking at what, uh, what they're going to be interested in, I think it's going to be really, really interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the big interesting trends coming up that I'm, I'm super curious to, to look into is, is the, like you said, the difference in the different generations, right. With Gen Alpha coming up, they're not like millennials, millennials and, and Gen Z are obviously like, um, like, you know, oil and vinegar, like they're just opposing forces. So it's going to be interesting to see how their habits kind of shake out, um, you know, millennials have been obviously very well documented in our, our uh, behaviors. You know, we seek games that offer a break from reality and a sense of accomplishment. Uh, we like to discover new games through, you know, diverse media, including specialized gaming sites and forums. And we care about games that kind of offer a sense of achievement and competition, as well as convenience of, of you know, mobile gaming, just for example. Um, Gen Z values that social connectivity offered by games, you know, finding new titles through social influencers and streaming content. Streaming content is huge. You know, the amount of people who are watching gaming now is insane. Uh, as a millennial, I don't actually get it, but I will, I buy into it. You know, uh, they're looking for games that can be played and enjoyed with friends. You know, they care about the social aspect and the customization of, of, uh, you know, whatever they can, you know, kind of get their hands on to show their own personality. Um, they love multiplayer features and, and community engagement, you know, and they reflect on their preferences of games that kind of like facilitate like those social interactions. Gen Alpha, obviously they're very, very young still, right? But they're they're focusing on games that are easily accessible on, on mobile devices and offer content that appeals to their interests, right? Um, because they are kids right now, their discovery is heavily influenced by family and friends and kid oriented like online content, you know, watching shows on, on YouTube and, and, you know, and Roblox and, you know, being a part of that kind of, you know, it's gonna be interesting to see how they kind of grow up with this ability to create their own games with their friends and then produce them and publish them and, and you know, potentially be creators uh, themselves in a very, very different way than just live streaming, but creating content as, you know, like gaming content. Um, and they care, they care about games that are accessible on, you know, on mobile platforms, because that's what they have access to, right? Tablets and, and their parents' phones. Uh, and, and offering engaging content suitable, you know, obviously for their age and, and privacy is, is important. Um, I was listening to a deconstructor of fun episode the other day where they interviewed some kids playing Roblox and they, 
the kids themselves brought that up. They said, you know, we met these people online and, and we added them to their, our friends list. And we thought, well, this is kind of weird and creepy. So we removed, you know, that's, it's very different than, you know, us, you know, or millennials who grew up, you know, at the early stages of the internet, we're like, we just want to be friends with everybody. And our friends lists were, were ridiculous, right? Like the amount of random people I have on, on my Facebook page is just insane. <laughs> I don't even remember who they are. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm not going to, I'm not going to remove them. Right. So I think like the, the shifting in, in, in knowledge and the way that people are interacting and finding the importance of customization, uh, you know, for Gen Z and then Gen Alpha saying like customization doesn't matter. We'd rather just be good at the game. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how those consumption habits of, of content and, and community kind of change. So um, I'm super curious. I, I'm excited. Um, I'm, you know, I'm sure there'll be new social channels that we'll have to learn and, and TikTok will be for old people like Facebook is now. And, and so this is going to be interesting to see how it all, all shakes up. But yeah, that's what I'm, I'm most excited for. Awesome. Awesome. Mike, not, ne never enough time, but thank you so much for, for joining us today. Really enjoyed the conversation. To our listeners, thanks for joining us and uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks, Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. You made it to the end. Congratulations.